Welcome to episode number 338 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for all of you marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. You can find us by searching for Beyond Social Media Show. We are recording on February 13, 2021. You'll want to tune in next week for my interview with Steve Clift, who's the CEO of Good Carts and a pioneer in digital democracy and online civic engagement. We're going to discuss um, how the internet went from uh, so inspiring and uh, and a platform for good to what it has become. Uh, so it'll be an interesting discussion. But this week, we have a lot of t- topics to uh, tackle, including presidential valentines, thank you pages, shame cards, fact checker bylines, social audio, AI voices, Lincoln TV, Duolingo, super social, conference sounds, Twitter newsletters, Google News Analytics, Norton's prying eyes and listening ears, and the safest and most dangerous online dating stage. You want to stick around for those stats, uh, but we kick it off with the all best. We're not doing any worse stories this week. All best stories of the week, and BL kicks it off with the best story. BL, what do you got? Well, Yesterday at the White House, there was a Valentine's surprise and that apparently Jill Biden does some type of surprise for the president every year. So yesterday uh, on the lawn, she had overnight had them put up these big hearts and on each heart it said things like healing, courage, love, compassion, gratitude, peace, amour, strength, kindness, family, unity, all the things we haven't had that we need. And she brings him out to see it and they come out and he's wearing jeans and a bomber jacket. They're both carrying coffee and paper cups. The the first dogs were off leash. They were hanging out on the lawn and the Bidens talked to reporters like they were their next door neighbors. And one of the reporters said, hey, you didn't bring any coffee for us. And he walks over to her and says, please take this. I haven't touched it. I swear I haven't had any of it. This is yours. He gives her his cup and uh Jill Biden says, come back next week and I'll bring the donuts. So I'm betting that there's going to be bagels with Biden on Friday with the reporters. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. I hope that becomes a thing. And, and he said that she surprises him every year that when he was vice president, he came into his office in the morning and overnight she had painted or had somebody paint hearts. And inside it said, Joe loves Jill, Jill loves Joe, Joe loves Jill, and all the window panes. He said he had 18 of them. So the whole thing, I mean, I could have cried. It was so comforting. It was so human. It was so warm, you know, people who obviously care for each other and for other people and who think that the reporters are doing their job. You know, to me, it makes it feel like there's hope for America. A uh, lot to be thankful for with that. Um, that that was, a, that was a sweet story, and uh, and um, uh, here's another thing to be thankful for: uh, six examples of thank you pages for 2021. <laughs> this is from a HubSpot article. Um, they cite uh, I'll just cite a couple of them that they uh, that they uh, mention in the uh, in the uh, article, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can actually see them. But Ax- Axios Social has a contact form confirmation page that includes social proof on it. So it says we're trusted by and has the company logos on it. So uh, creating that, uh, that, that higher level of trust with that. There's a content marketing institute content download page. So you sign up for a PDF white paper or a PDF uh, ebook or whatever, and then get the uh, confirmation page where you download the PDF. They have on that thank you page, on that confirmation page, additional articles that you'll also like more their, their most most popular stories. So it keeps people on the on the site longer, which is um, many people think and I think it stands to reason a uh, social a, a search uh, ranking factor somebody comes to your site they convert and then they stay on the 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 site longer after they convert uh is an indication that it's trusted content or good content so that's likely uh, a ranking factor for search so that's an interesting tactic there amazon of course their post purchase thank you page they have it customized they have related items that you've viewed before 
top picks that they picked out for you, inspiration from your browsing history, and then buy it again uh, as well. So they obviously do a great job with all the data that they have. Uh, Open Table uh, has a reservation confirmation page that uh, prompts you to download their app so you can adjust things on the fly if you need to. And um, and then it also tells you what you need to know about the restaurant before you arrive there. So any additional things you, you should know. Backlinkio has uh, Backlinko has a account creation uh, confirmation page that um, that has an urgent but friendly reminder to uh, confirm your your your. Uh, account creation. So this, it says you need to confirm your email right now. <laughs> a little urgency there. <laughs> and then finally, Save the Chimps has a donation thank you page that features, a, it says thank you on it, but it features the full whip photo of a chimpanzee looking directly at you. So that's a re really clever way of, uh, of uh, for that experience for donating. Yeah, that that's often just wasted space. Yep. Those are really smart. So this one, I have this in good news. Um, it's a sad thing, but it's a good thing. Um, on the third anniversary of the Valentine's shooting at uh, Valentine's Day shooting at Stoneman Davis High School in Parkland, Florida, organization called Change the Ref um, released the American Shame Card Collection. And these are postcards with gruesome scenes from each mass shooting. Um, but uh, this was made by an agency called Mullen Lowe, and they've come up with quite a lot of clever ways of advocating for gun control. And it, it's a Boston agency, and Change the Ref um, advocates for stricter gun control. So um, Jacun Oliver, who's the, the son of Change the Ref founders Manny and Patricia Oliver, um, was killed during the Parkland shooting. So they are doing this in his memory. And what they do is they use urban art and nonviolent creative confrontation generally <laughs> to expose the disastrous effects of mass shootings. So um, the ultimate goal is to give the younger generation of survivors and, um, and, and victims a disrupting way to lead the charge to a more peaceful future. That's their goal. And so the new campaign uh, is it done in the style of tourist postcards because basically every state has them. Most big cities have them. And basically they are an urgent appeal to Congress to um, tilt towards the Democrats to bring some glimmer of hope for stricter gun laws. So uh, the shame card collection has 53 postcards, more on the way. They're designed by more than 30 designers all over the world. There's a video um, explaining the project and each uh, postcard looks like when you just look at it from far away, a 3D tourist postcard, but um, that's not what they are. And they're not shying away from the gruesome realities of these shootings. So visitors can choose a postcard, enter their first name, pick a person in Congress, and they will send it to that person. They will mail a physical uh, postcard and they printed out several hundred copies of each card so that they can do that. So. Um, Renato Barreto and Marcelo Maciel, who are the associate creative directors at the agency, began the project a year ago and they started researching and they realized pretty much every city has these uh, postcards and every state has at least on fortunately one mass shooting. So um, Barreto said, we're doing this to send them to Congress. We need to, we need the representatives to feel how many people in these places feel. So besides the website and the postcards, uh, a shame card mural is going to be on display in Parkland and pop up postcard stands in Los Angeles, Houston, New York and Seattle. I think it's a clever way to bring attention to this horrible situation and and advocate for change. And, you know, sometimes you really have to have a physical way of doing that. And uh, that isn't a protest. And, you know, this will actually put the message into the hands of Congress. So I like this idea a lot. That's very creative, very creative and powerful way yeah. of, of getting, the, getting the message across. And, uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, really um, a clever advocacy uh, campaign. That's, that's cool. Um, speaking of creativity i was uh doing some research and came across a uh, tree hugger article by katherine martinko and uh noticed you know uh, 
articles had the byline uh, at the top of the article all the time. Um, this one had was no different, had a byline by, uh, by Catherine Martinko, but also had on the same line, a fact checker byline, which is, I've never seen that before. Uh, so no. it says uh, the byline of the reporter, and then next to it is fact checked by, in this case, Haley Mast is the fact checker for this part, particular article. And uh, when you hover over over the byline for the fact checker, has a hover card that pops up with a date stamp of when the article was fact checked. It includes a link to the bio of the fact checker, and then links to a link to their uh, fact checking process page where they explain how they do their fact checking. So just really smart way of building trust in your content. So I thought I'd pull that out. I have a screenshot of it. We'll link to it in the show notes as well. Boy, that is an idea that I certainly would love to see spread. Yeah, that's a really great idea that 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 has such huge uh, implications, you know, so um, there is going on right now a social audio growth explosion. And uh, my friend Jeremiah O. Oh, Yang uh, did a market forecast that has an overview and has predictions on the future of social audio like Clubhouse, which uh, has already earned a one point a one billion dollar valuation and already has more than three million users. So um, this um, this article uh, is, you know, he talks about millions of uh, quarantined limited people who have no social life anymore are downloading apps for real-time audio conversation with friends and family. And people tell me like they just leave it on in the background like radio just to hear people. But um, <laughs> the visual interfaces vary, but from you know emoticons to text chat integration to avatar integration, uh, modern app versions have social graphs, groups, other social networking features that you'll find in tools like Facebook, Messenger, WhatsApp, and so on. Um, Oyang o o lists 24 social audio platforms. I had no idea there were that many in the growing marketplace. And, uh, you know, he says among the drivers of the trend is a desire for human connection beyond text and fatigue from too many video conference calls. You know, you, you don't have to, you know, get dressed to do audio. So um, he also lists 15 possible business models for the social audio apps, including premium rooms, which is already being experimented with, branded clubs, um, sponsored audio influencers, ad banners, paid chats, um, paid data analytics and API access. And he makes seven market predictions, including rapid adoption, um, acquisition by a giant company like Google or Amazon or Facebook, social video integration into the uh, digital touch points and uh, as another interaction point or in addition to comments or emoticons. So um, Jeremiah has been really sharp about trend forecasting for the last 20 years. And I would guess that he's taken some good shots here. <clears throat> Interesting. Or, you know, I'm all about audio marketing, as you know, BL, that's another, uh, yeah. another uh, uh, piece of evidence that shows how that is, uh, the trend is growing. I um, recently, a couple of several episodes back, I, I had been saying about how I'm not going to up upgrade my iPhone uh, until it dies, because who needs to spend another $1,000 on, <laughs> on a phone? Um, but I just upgraded my iPhone. <laughs> Of course and you did. The reason I did is because I needed to get on Clubhouse. Um, and my phone did not, my old phone did not support the iOS version of it. I couldn't upgrade it high enough to, to uh, it wasn't supported by Clubhouse, the app. So I was kind of forced to buy a new phone. So um, I could get So what Clubhouse. do you think about Clubhouse, Dave? Uh, I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't delved into it enough to have a, have a solid, opinion on it, but it, it's very interesting. And clearly there's a lot of people who are interested in it. So it's something I need to investigate further, but. Uh... I have mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, I know that some people just use it for background, but you know, it is talk, 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 talk. 
And uh, I have a limited um, tolerance for some of it, but there is also some truly fascinating information there and that I haven't seen in other places. And there is on Saturday night, there's this virtual dinner party you should definitely try to, to listen to from Felicia Horowitz. And she gets a thousand people. Last week, the room was full and you had to wait for somebody to leave to come in. And she has such fascinating people, Mark Andreessen, George Conway, um, Gail King from uh, CBS This Morning, you know, um, just really, really interesting people who come in and, and speak and the topics are always really relevant, but, um, you know, <clears throat> not a lot of that level of content there yet. And there's also issues with misogyny and, uh, trolling and anti-Semitism. And so they're, you know, it's a big platform already and, and they have to figure out what to do about all of that. Yeah, they are certainly uh, leaning hard on the uh, exclusivity thing. So you need to get an invite to get to get into Clubhouse. Um, when you join, you get two invites. Um, but you can earn more the more that you use the app. So they're uh, <laughs> incentivizing yeah, but... you these use it more to, to no i'm not invites. incentivized at all i have 20 invites if you want to send those invites out you first have to share your gmail contacts i will not do that yeah, what you do what the hell do they need to you, know what, what do you, they need that for and what you do bl is you create a different gmail account and um put who you want in there and then use that gmail account that's all you I guess do. I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, trouble. they are incentivizing it. And then this this whole, you know, room capacity is you can't join because there are too many people in the room. What are you talking about? It's a virtual platform. You have as many right, people exactly. as you want in the room. <laughs> exactly. You could have a million in there. I mean, it's funny. Yeah. But uh... <laughs> so um, I got a I got a, a voice story to follow on that. This is really interesting. <laughs> This is from Protocol's uh, Jenko uh, Rutgers, who reports on Microsoft, uh, who has, I didn't know this, but Microsoft has a, a, a custom neural voice product that they are now opening up to commercial partners. So it allows companies to generate their own voices for chatbots and interactive applications. It's based on uh, Microsoft's Azure AI platform and it uses a neural network to create voices that don't sound robotic. Doesn't sound like, you know, your, your, uh, your Echo reading your Kindle book. Um, <laughs> so there's some examples of this. AT&T, which owns Warner Media, is using this platform to bring Bug Bugs Bunny to life in its Dallas Experience store. Uh, so customers can chat with the Looney Tunes character. Um, Progressive, the insurance company, has got a voice chat bot for uh, Flo, their character Flo. Duolingo is using it to create multilingual voices for a set of characters that they're going to use to bring the uh, language learning app to, uh, to some personality to it. Google and Amazon have both created generated celebrity voices for their uh, assistants. And Amazon recently announced that, uh, that it would white label uh, she who shall not be named in this podcast, um, otherwise known as Echo. Um, but <laughs> Microsoft also, the article cites, uh, they recognize that there's potential for abuse, deep fake audio, obviously. So they will limit their access, the access to the platform to pre-approved partners who've uh, contractually agreed to a code of conduct. Uh, the customers have to agree to add disclaimers to uh, any use of it that where customers could mistake an AI voice for a real person. Uh, they're exploring the use of watermarks for AI, so AI recordings can't be used out of context. I don't quite know how that would work, but there you go. And um, then they're asking uh, the voice actors that are using to, to, uh, to uh, create the database or the, the data set to uh, create the, the uh, voices, they're asking those voice actors to knowingly uh, and acknowledge within their recordings that they're participating in AI uh, voice projects. So that's intended to be a safeguard against voice jacking, basically. Well, that's really interesting. 
And and I think that there's a huge uh, possibility for fraud there, but um, it's it's really kind of a next step. You know, we've talked about this so much about how brands should have have uh, recognizable music and and voices and things like that. So, but I'd like to talk to Bugs Bunny. I think that'd be fun. So as we were discussing before the show, the Lincoln Project is having a bit of uh, problems lately um with uh their staff and uh but they've done something this week the lincoln project is expanding its video and podcast presence and they have a new show called the lincoln report that joins the breakdown so the lincoln report um has uh is now five nights a week uh with an additional brand new show called the lincoln Pro the lincoln report and it's hosted by naira hogg and co-founder uh, co Rick Wilson, uh, and they're broadcasting live at eight Eastern, seven Central on the Lincoln Channel's YouTube, uh, on the Lincoln Project's YouTube channel, I meant to say. Um, so this is in addition to the breakdown, which is live at 9 p.m. Eastern with the host is Tara Setmeyer. So they're obviously moving in a new direction. Yeah, yeah. It with new people. It's going to be interesting. I mean, they've run into some controversy lately. We we discussed That's what that I was just saying. before the show. Yeah. yeah so um, it will be interesting to see how that shakes out. Uh, I I mentioned Duolingo in the in the last article, and um, have you? I don't know if they're running in your area, but uh, in Minnesota, they are running a heavy rotation of their Duolingo commercials on TV. Have you seen those? No. So it's an animated uh, commercial. I think it's maybe a thirty second spot. And it's uh, it's it's basically an animated commercial with a song. The song says, uh, "When language learning gets hard, make it fun. Your head is exploding. Your confidence eroding. Language learning is hard, so we made it fun." It just it gets. <laughs> I, I want to sing along every time it it comes on, and it reminds. So it uh, back when I was in college, there was a uh, restaurant or a bar they called the vine and they did this heavy rotation uh radio advertisement for it uh in iowa city uh and it, it went the vine 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 <laughs> so <laughs> that got in my head back in the day and i used to sing it all the time going the vine vine while i'm doing something. and pam one time pants it surreptitiously recorded me singing that <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is kind of the updated version of that. When it comes at the end, it says language learning is hard. So we made it fun. And whenever the, <laughs> whenever the ad comes on, I always have to sing that. <laughs> so okay, anyway. there's an ad for there's an ad for a hospital, and they're all dancing. And every time that comes on, I drop everything and I start <laughs> dancing around the house. You know, I just love the song that they have on it. Can't tell you what hospital it is though, but I love the music. So. <laughs> Oh, of course, everybody knows last week was the Super Bowl, and um, which I thought was pretty dull. But um, uh, so there were the, the way that that brands use social media, the ones who set out the advertising and the ones who advertise there were virtual stadiums there was inter there were interactive filters there were football stars and loads of sweepstakes that uh were part of the social themes and so cheeto nike facebook and others um all had social media things going on so this is from an ad age article by elise Lifring. And so the brands either skip, many brands either skip the expensive buys or, you know, I, I think a lot of brands really weren't sure what tone to take in this pandemic. And so uh, what they did was they diverted their attention to social media and supporting uh, the ones who had advertising uh, supported their ads with social pushes, but many of them were lighthearted and attempts at standing out in the social feed. So Frito-Lay brand Cheetos had a celebrity filled uh, Super Bowl spot this year with Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher and Shaggy to promote their Cheeto crunch pop mix. And so there was a major push for that on Snapchat, Twitter, and TikTok. And when the spot runs in the game's third quarter, fans could win a bag of Cheetos Crunch Pop Mix by opening up Snapchat, pointing their camera at the commercial and holding down on their screen. And then um, the brand was promoting the trick through a special snap lens with its mascot Chester 
cheetah and a video and um, other social aspect, assets uh, describe the Snapchat push as the first Super Bowl uh, spot you can steal from. <laughs> But I you know it's kind of fun. And I, I just think most brands really had no idea how they should have acted this year. You know? Yeah, it was um, so hard, hard to know. And look yeah. what happened to poor Springsteen. Yeah, the um, the Cheetos ad was cute. That was uh, it was it wasn't me. It was me. And it's not easy being cheesy. So I will always be enamored with the uh, with the Cheetos spokes for spokes character <laughs> spokes Cheetah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the ads were, I mean, as sparse as they were, um, it was probably smart just because it was not to not to you know spend money on Super Bowl ad, just because the game was so horrible. It was awful. It was awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was um, awful. Yeah. My father said it was the dullest Super Bowl he ever saw, and he's ninety three. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen all of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was on another. So I did another another uh, research find that I came across, and this is really quick, but uh, I thought it was very clever. Uh, the, I came across a, a YouTube video on uh, a conference of a conference, three hour long conference uh, for long COVID. So it was a forum for long COVID, long haulers in COVID, of COVID. Um, but before the conference started, they had, it was a live stream on YouTube, they had an audio loop of conference sounds. So as everybody's waiting for the conference to start, you hear the murmuring of the crowd and people drinking and, uh, and steps and stuff. And it's just the same sounds you would hear if you were outside you of the were conference there. in the lobby waiting for the conference to begin. So I just thought that was a really clever uh, clever way of, of um, building anticipation, I guess. Um, but we'll, we'll embed it in the show notes so people can <laughs> check it out. I like that. So does that bring us to smiles? Oh, no. I got a couple of more here. I got several okay. more. Okay. Yeah. You Actually, roll with it then. Yeah. <laughs> so these are quick, though. Uh, Twitter has added a new menu item to when you go to your, your Twitter account uh, and you click on the more button on your Twitter account, you'll now know that there's a new, you'll now see that there's a new menu item under more, which is for review. It's uh, newsletters. And they're saying new. So Twitter has bought a newsletter company called uh, Review, and they are a Substack competitor. Um, so that's that was interesting. Um, we'll see it. See if it takes off. Substack certainly has gained a lot of uh, adoptees um, since the pandemic. Um, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, Google so News. So I wait, wait, wait. Go ahead, go ahead. I registered. I registered our us with it, and okay. we're going to put our newsletter on there. I had a conversation with the editor, whose name I don't have in front of me, but um, he said, "Yeah, go for it. Why not?" And it's totally free right now. Who knows how long that will be? But right now, it's completely free. Yeah, and well, it is. It's free, and uh, I think they're just they're charging. Well. I think they they've lowered their what I read on the Twitter blog was they lowered the um, take that um, review or Twitter takes from the newsletter for paid subscriptions to five percent. Um, oh. So apparently that's I don't know what Substacks is, but it's competitive is what they say. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see. Interesting. Um, Google News uh, is, or Google has added a new feature to the Google Search Console. This is from Search Engine Land's Barry, Barry Schwartz. Uh, so now in your Google Search Console, if you have content that's showing up in Google News, news.google.com, um, you will get analytics for, for that content. So you get clicks, impressions, click-through rates uh, for any content that is showing of, of your content that's showing up in Google News uh, or through the Google News app on Android and, and iOS. So that's new, new data that people did not have previously. Finally, this is my last good one, then we'll get to uh, smiles. Um, and this is kind of smiling too. Uh, Norton, uh, the uh, antivirus security software company is running an ad um, that I thought was, was very cleverly done. Uh, it starts off with, uh, with somebody, a voiceover saying, ever get the feeling you're being watched? And then it's a guy in a coffee shop, he's surfing on his phone and the commercial 
anthropomorphizes everyday objects. So inanimate objects have eyes. So there's a radio that has speakers, looks like it has, has a face. There's a smoke, smoke detector that looks like it has a face. There's a mop <laughs> that looks like it has a face. There's a pastry that's cut in half to reveal two blueberry eyes in a, in a, in a <laughs> smiling mouth. And, and, and a Wi-Fi router winks at you. Um, so as this guy is about to uh, make a mobile purchase, he looks down and uh, at his latte, and his latte is staring back at him with an eye in, this, in a mouth. And it's basically, you know, keep prying eyes out with Norton 360 uh, security software. So we'll embed That's that so in show funny. notes too, but I think it's, yeah, you know, cleverly done. You know, when I interviewed JT Costman, he told me that sometimes, he works in AI, he told, and, and security and all of that. And he told me that sometimes just for the fun of it, when he goes into Starbucks or whatever, he just gets into everybody's computer just for fun. <laughs> because he can. I mean, apparently it's so easy that, you know, if you know what you're doing, you can do it in a matter of seconds. So Norton's probably a good idea there. <laughs> does that bring us to our smiles? It does, yes. What made you smile? Well, the catastrophe that happened uh, this week, um, a lawyer in Texas, uh, apparently his young son had been using his computer before him and had been using a cat filter in place of his face on a Zoom call. And uh, so the lawyer, uh, he had to say, I'm not a cat, to which the judge responded, I can see that. So, you know, courts don't usually let cats argue cases, but this was uh, Rod Ponton, and he's a, an attorney, a county attorney in Presidio County, Texas, and he couldn't figure out how to turn off the uh, cat filter on his Zoom. So um, he was, uh, he he was you know doing it in good spirit but somebody recorded some of it which is really very funny and and he said you know hey if i can make the country chuckle for a minute in these difficult times that that they're going through i'm happy to do that at my you know let them do that at my expense so he said he was using his secretary's computer and uh that she was mortified by the mistake but she didn't know how to do it and he also said his son had used the computer before him and turned on the cat filter so the video was actually released by the circuit court and it's just a few seconds but it immediately got six million views and the story trended on twitter and the cat was adorable it had moving eyes and its mouth moved and um, so the judge, Roy Ferguson, said, Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. And, and uh, he was the judge presiding over the case. And um, Ponton's, oh, in exasperation. And, and his kitten face is looking forlornly at everybody. And his eyes are, you know, looking like they're really shameful and sad. So funny. And he said, can you hear me, judge? And uh it, audio wasn't the issue, it was the video. So another lawyer on the call then puts on his glasses and leans in to take a better look at the at the cat. And he adjusts his tie and um, he tries to keep a straight face. But uh, as he does, a, a stone faced man in the other in another box who was identified as Jerry Phillips, he he just seemed to be completely unfazed by the cat. So Mr. Ponton said, I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying. Then he offers to get the, <laughs> the hearing moving. He says, I'm prepared to go forward with it. And then crucially, he clar clar clarifies, I'm here live. I'm not a cat. So this causes Phillips to look up. And finally, the exchange draws a smile and a laugh. And the judge says, yes, I can see that. So <laughs> The video is like less than a minute long, but it went globally viral. It's hilarious. I'll put yeah, it in the show notes. <laughs> um, yeah, it was the, what what was most hilarious about it was you know it wasn't it wasn't an adult cat. It was a tiny kitten, kitten. with a yeah. you know small head and huge eyes, huge you know yeah. round eyes like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was like a real cat. I mean, it wasn't a cartoon cat. It was really very funny. <laughs> So um, mine is, um, I actually caught this live, uh, but this is from uh, Neil Justin of the Star Tribune wrote about it. Uh, National Public Radio's uh, most famous show probably is All Things Considered. Um, and what I caught live was this kid um, calling in, talking about, <laughs> so there's this kid named Leo Shilda, Shid, Shidla, I think is how you pronounce the name. He's a Minnesota kid. He's eight years old. And uh, he was frustrated by hearing so much about politics and the pandemic on the news programs. So he sent an email to the producers 
of National Public Radio voicing his concerns. And uh, the email said, I listen to All Things Considered in the car with my mom. I listen a lot. I never hear much about nature or dinosaurs or things like that. Maybe you could call <laughs> your, maybe you could call your, you should call your show Newsy Things Considered since I don't get to hear about all the things. Or please talk more about dinosaurs and cool things. And so they they interviewed this thing. They, they brought this kid on. They interviewed him. They paired him with a paleontologist so he could ask the paleontologist <laughs> about dinosaurs and stuff. And it was it was just adorable. So put a link to it That's in the show so notes. That's so cute. I love that. So that brings. Oh, you froze. That shiny objects. Okay, so I have a bunch. Um, one of them is Vimeo School, uh, which has a whole bunch of excellent free how-to videos on how to use Vimeo and more that. It has how to make a GIF from your video uh, that happens to be built into uh, Vimeo and also how to make time-lapse videos. Uh, and it's got lighting tips. It's got lots more stuff. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but very helpful stuff for very Vimeo. Cool. Very cool. Um, I had, uh, it had a research project I was doing um, this past week and uh, had occasion to try Rival IQ, which is a social media competitive uh, analysis uh, uh, service. Uh, so it examines social, it does social post analysis, social media audits, social reporting. You can compare your social presence with competitors. So I did uh, one company and five of the competitors, and it gives you a, a nice dashboard of how you compare to all of the other competitors that you're doing. Uh, it is a four fee project, so it's it's it, it starts at a one ninety nine a month and goes up three different levels to four ninety nine a month for like an agency uh, um, service. But they do have free tools that you can try out for head to head snapshots, so you can do your Facebook um, presence with an another Facebook presence, one, you know, uh, you only get two options, yours and somebody else's. Same thing with Instagram, th same thing with Twitter. So those are free and uh, it compares your activity, engagement, audience metrics, but the the, uh, the paid tool, you know, does, uh, does growth and it does a uh, number of followers and all the stuff you'd expect, but it also surfaces the most engaging posts on each of the platforms. So you can kind of get a, get an idea of what kind of traction competitors are, are, are getting and how you're comparing. Oh, I like that. I'm going to try that. That sounds really useful. So um, this is via uh, Peggy K. And uh, she says that YouTube's testing clips. We don't have it yet. I looked, but it's a new feature that lets you share specific moments from a live stream or a video. It's only available on a few channels. Hopefully we'll have it soon, but you can find, and then they have, there'll be a page with all your clips. Um, and that will be at uh, youtube.com slash feed slash clips. And so that's going to become a useful way to save video highlights for your own future reference and to share in social media. And the cool thing is when you share it on Twitter, just the clip shows it's not like, you know, all the other stuff around it. It's kind of like our audiograms, you know, it's just a small, but it's video and uh, it's free. Very cool. So there's a sneak peek um, that has a how to, and I'll put a, a link to that video. I'm gonna have to Do you check. Have another? I, I don't, but I'm gonna have to check and see if I have have it on one of my channels. <laughs> I want to try. Yeah, that I out don't now. know how they're. Yeah, I don't know how they're they're picking those. But oh. uh, Google also has another new resource. It's called Quick Tips, and um, you can just get quick videos on how to use various Google tools, and you can get answers there to FAQs. And uh, so I'll put a link to that. That that's brand new, and uh, they also just. Um, revise their Google tools learning and call it something else. Google, I, f I forgot when they call it, but they, they changed all of those things. Google They're all free. changing the name of something. Yeah, right. I mean, that's their favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, there's, we, those are some goodies that we have. Oh, yeah. And no politics. No politics. Uh, let's uh, wrap this up with some Valentine's numbers with Valentine's Day coming up tomorrow. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Uh, this is from highspeedinternet.com, who have put together an infographic of the safest and most dangerous states for online dating. So pay attention. Um, for the third year in a <laughs> row, they say, Alaska was ranked as the 
the most dangerous state for online dating. Uh, the East Coast seems safer than the West Coast. Most of the safest states for online dating were in the East, while Nevada, California, Colorado, and other states in the West were the most dangerous. The safest state for online dating is Maine, followed by West Virginia and Vermont. Minnesota is ninth, I should note. Um, New York is not listed among the safest, nor is it listed among the most dangerous. So I think it's kind of uh, neutral. You should be good there. Um, most dangerous state following Alaska is Nevada and California. So you may ask, as I did, what was their methodology for figuring this out? <laughs> uh, they ranked, they state, they, they uh, ranked their states based on FBI statistics about cyber crime victims and total funds lost to digital fraudsters. They also analyzed data about uh, STD cases in each state. <laughs> <laughs> and then they uh, they normalized their uh, state's numbers and blah, blah, blah. I'll put the rest in the show notes. But uh, um, yeah, so if you're in a safe state, happy Valentine's Day. If you're in a non-safe safe state, be careful out there. <laughs> what a good bunch of stats. Um, <laughs> New York's not on there. That's kind of odd. So that brings us to the end of episode 338 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And uh, I'm here, of course, with David Erickson, who is D. Erickson on Twitter, D. E. Erickson on Instagram, at YouTube, he's E. Strategy, and he blogs at E. Strategyblog.com, which I highly recommend to you. Uh, I'm What's Next on Twitter. I blog uh, at What's Next Blog. My YouTube channel, unsurprisingly, is What's Next Blog. Uh, I have a website at blockman.com. And the show, just search for Beyond Social Media Show and you'll find us. But um, all our show notes, the video links to everything we discussed today will be at beyondsocialmediashow.com slash 338. And on Twitter, we're at BS Media Show. And you can listen and subscribe, please, to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. We're also, you can also tell your Echo that it should play Beyond Social Media Show. And she who shall not be named will do that. And while I have you here, please do subscribe to the Beyond Social Media Show newsletter. And uh, we will send you our newsletter on a weekly basis. And we'll be back next week with David's interview. Who is muted?